Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2020 of Orlando, Florida, being held for the first time ever at the Big Badass 21 Summit. Our next speaker is a glorious returning speaker to the 21 Convention, speaking for his first time last year at our 18th 21 Convention in Orlando, Florida last fall. He's also the world's most controversial dating coach and the world's leading expert on hypergamy. Without further ado, please help me welcome back to the 21 Convention stage, Pat Stedman. Unfortunately, today we're not going to be talking about hypergamy. We'll save that for another time. Last speech, I talked about the three pillars of attraction. And the third pillar that I talked about was personality. Now, we didn't have a lot of time to go into it last speech because it's a very deep subject. How do you deal with making a personality more healthy? But I wanted to spend some time about it today because it's something that I work on with a lot of clients. And I wanted to talk about how to heal yourself as a man. So one of the things that I see a ton, for instance, in the manosphere, is this idea of, of self-improvement. And where does self-improvement, where does this idea come from? So you look around at people, and I think everybody here can relate to this. You have a voice in your head that we might call it the inner critic. And it's this voice that'll tell you, oh, you know, you, you fucked this up, you screwed this thing up, oh, this girl doesn't like you. You know, you're not jacked enough. You, have, you don't make enough money. And a lot of guys, when they're first starting off, when they're in their teens or early 20s, this voice is very sort of subtle. Or, or, or I wouldn't say subtle necessarily so much as, as they can't, they don't think they can do anything about it. So you have this critic, and it just kind of beats them down. They don't feel very good about themselves. And... They don't feel like they have any agency. They have this victim attitude. And then something tends to happen for a lot of guys in their early 20s, or maybe after a serious breakup or a job loss. And they have this revelation all of a sudden where they feel like, well, actually, maybe I can change my life. Maybe I can improve. And I think every guy here has certainly made that jump. You wouldn't be at a convention like this that is all about becoming a better man if you didn't think that you could become a better man. But there's a dark side to self-improvement that I've seen. And it's this idea that you have to constantly get to a certain point. So you have this inner critic. And what happens is when guys have this revelation is it's like another, that, th that voice evolves. And it says, we're going to become stronger. We're going to become better. We're not going to allow ourselves to get pulled down. We're not going to be weak. And you see this stuff all the time. I see it on Twitter. It's like, you must declare unceasing war against yourself. Or you must kill the bitch within you. And unfortunately, that creates a lot of negative self-talk. Now, the trap that guys have, they don't like this way of being. And some guys maybe plow through it. Some guys push through with this self-improvement. And they make progress, right? And, and you know, some guys make even more than others. And, and they just overpower this sort of weaker part of themselves. But for a lot of guys, it's like two steps forward, like 1.9 steps backward. And it's just like slog. And they know they can't go back to the way it was before. They know they can't go back to this helpless position. But it's so difficult. It's still so difficult to move forward. My perspective on this is that, relatively speaking, of course, self-improvement is a positive, right? You don't want to be the guy who gives up on life, but does it really have to be so hard? In order for us to fix this, we have to figure out where this critic came from, right? Because guys who go so far with their development, like I, I've worked with guys, multimillionaires, guys who have like lived the elite lifestyle. They're Jack, they can date any girl they want, they have multiple businesses, and they're still not happy on a certain level. They still don't feel like they can get close to people. So to do that, we have to go back to the critics. So the topic today, how to heal yourself as a man, I've got to get this marker off. And there's going to be three steps to healing yourself. Now, I recommend, of course, I think that you can go through this process a lot faster if you work with somebody. 
But a lot of guys, even if you do this on your own and you don't work with somebody, it's important to just be aware of it. So the first thing, step number one, is reconcile with your father. Reconcile with your father and put boundaries on your mother. So, why is this important? Well, the critical voice tends to come from our father. Now, not always exactly from our father. It could come from other men in a life. It could come from a brother. It could even come from your mother. It could come from being bullied, for instance. Right? And I think that you know, we have a very nuanced view on bullying here because on one hand, we think you know, guys maybe need to get a little bit more toughening up. And I agree with that entirely. But bullying is not so much like a guy telling you to get, be stronger. It's often an abusive dynamic. And it can really, like working with guys who have been bullied, it can really mess with your psyche for years. And so wherever you got this, but very often, very often it's the father. Very often it's the father. And even if it did come from, for instance, the mother over coddling, on a fundamental level, that's because the father was somehow not bringing a healthy masculine energy. And so very often you see with fathers, you see that they're critical or abusive even, or they're distant. Maybe they've been away from home on, from work all the time, so then you feel ab abandoned as a child. Maybe they are just simply weak, and they get walked over. There's a really, really good movie. I think people should see it just because it's a classic. But it's actually like it has so many interesting themes in this. And I was never expecting it when I saw it. And that's Rebel Without a Cause. So this is James Dean. And it's funny because it's like Rebel Without a Cause. And James Dean is phenomenal in it. But it's not that he doesn't, like he has a cause. His cause is for him to have a different relationship with his father. So to paint the picture of this family, you have James Dean, this rebellious teenager. And then you have his father, who his, you have his father, his mother, and his grandmother, and they all live together. And his father is just constantly run over by his mother and his grandmother. He's just like the most henpecked guy in the world, and he's kind of a buffoon. And there's a really like poignant scenes. Like James Dean is so frustrated by this. He's so frustrated at how weak his father is. And there's this scene in it where he's like contemplating going out to going like drag racing and he's kind of on the edge. Like this isn't a good thing. I know I shouldn't do it. And his father, he sees his father, he hears a noise and he sees his father had come upstairs with this breakfast tray. And he was bringing breakfast for his mother. Now, I don't think it's like a bad thing for you to ever bring you know, food for your wife. <laughs> Under any circumstances, my wife is in the room, so she probably would agree with that. But to understand the context of this relationship, this is a guy who's people-pleasing. Right? He's doing this because, oh, she's had, you know, she was complaining, so he wants to try to make her feel better, so he's going he's gonna to bring her this food. And so then he's going to get the approval. And to really like make this scene so powerful for the viewer, they have the father dressed in this like 1950s like housewife apron. So he just looks like absurd and completely emasculated. And so he, he's going up the stairs and he, and he sort of like, I guess he trips and he drops the breakfast on the floor. And James Dean kind of catches him and, they're, and, and he's like, oh, you dropped the breakfast. And they're kind of laughing about it. But then the father's like trying to clean it up. He's like, I got to clean it up to make sure that they don't, you know, they don't see it before they notice. And James Dean is like, leave it there. Let him see it, dad. Let him see it. And this is the theme throughout the movie, right? His mother is telling him at one point not to tell the truth when his father had told him to tell the truth. And he tells his father to stand up for him. And his father won't do it. Things don't get better in a certain sense. I'm not going to, there's a lot more to the movie, so you should still see it. But things don't really resolve. The, the pain that James Dean feels doesn't really resolve until his father at the end says, 
stand up, son, I'll stand up with you. I'll be as strong as you need me to be. So this, this issue with our fathers, it's really, really powerful. And even if we have issues with our mother, it always seems to come back to our father in some way because he didn't have a constraining influence on that. Elliot was talking earlier yesterday about the, the dark mother, right? This is, this is what happens. The dark mother expands when the father's not there. So we have to talk to our fathers because this critical voice that we have is a distillation of our father. Even if it's not exactly his voice, even if it's a voice that we cultivated on our own as some degree of a you know, projection of our emotions at the time, by healing our relationship with the father, we heal our relationship with masculinity and with being a, a man that's not distorted. Now, how do you go about doing this? Well, first off, you have to, I mean, there's a range of experiences guys have with their fathers. Sometimes the wound, like the father was pretty good, right? Even a very good father can still wound a child in some way with a comment. So sometimes it's a lot worse. But regardless of the degree of this, especially when you're a man, understand that if your father has done things that have hurt you, he hasn't been perfect, right? A lot of this comes from his own wounds, you know, the issues I had with my father, my father was pretty much left by his parents. You know, they were socialites. So he was left all the time with a nanny, like create his own imaginary world. And there's a dissociation that children will experience. And so when he was more distant to me and was, had a hard time getting close to me, well, I have to understand that, okay, yeah, you didn't give me this and this hurt when I was a kid, but at the same time, like, I have to understand that this is something that you got passed down to, and nobody, deal, nobody dealt with it with you. And so you're just, it's these generational cycles of trauma. What you'll find is that in the vast majority of cases, the father, like, wants to have this conversation. He just doesn't know how to do it. Because he, they, he wasn't, he didn't grow up with the emotional range to express it, especially as he gets older. Because you have these situations where, you know, the mother maybe bonds more with you and so in a certain sense, he gets pushed to the side. So he has all sorts of complicated feelings he doesn't know how to express. So you go into the conversation with an enormous amount of like, love and compassion. But you, you do put the question to him, like, why did, you, you know, why did you do this? Why do you do these things? Like, this is how it made me feel. And what you'll find is that he has a lot of emotions, too, usually, and, and that he welcomes this. And there's a big, there's a big reconciliation here. And, it's, and it clears you out. So much. This is very, very important. Now, if your father's not in the picture anymore, some people's fathers have died. Some people never knew their fathers. Some people, you know, their fathers just, they, it's, they really don't think that there's, based on the dynamic, that there's any real attempt to even communicate. And in these cases, it's obviously not ideal, but you can still go through some of this work. And I really recommend you write, write them a letter, write them something that puts out all these emotions out there. And of course, you don't have to send it but to do on your own time this sort of process of forgiving and, and reconciling. Now, at the same time as this, this conversation with your father has to ha occur really in private and certainly away from your mother, certainly away from other women. Because one of the big issues here is that you know, we, were, we were supposed to move as men. We were supposed to move like in our early teens you were supposed to move from our mother's house, so to speak, to our father's house. And a lot of different cultures throughout the, the world have had rituals like, like this where the children would be taken away from their mother. And we may look at it as being extreme by modern standards, and, and maybe it isn't the correct way to go about doing it in some sense, maybe. But there's something definitely to be said about the fact that we have never been able to move boys into this relationship with other men. So we're trying to do some work by dealing with our father later on in life. And by putting up more boundaries in general with our mother, it not only helps us to move more towards our father, which we should have been doing already, but better late than never, but it's also very, very important as an aside for your relationships. Because if you're in a situation where you know, you're trying to get serious with a woman, but your mother is still super involved in the picture, and you're bonding more with your mother than your wife. I mean, this is how a lot of very distorted 
generational cycles can occur with intimacy. Like you see this happen a lot, for instance, in, in India, where you have the mother moves in with the new couple, and the son is with the mother basically the entire time, and the mother oppresses the wife, and then their marriage isn't so good, and then when the mother dies, the wife does that with the new son, and it just kind of creates this, this real dissatisfaction. So we, I mean, that's more of an extreme example. It happens more and more in the West as well. So what happens after we, we deal with the father, we do this reconciliation with the father? Well, there will be a big release because somebody that you really cared about and always wanted to connect with, now you have the opportunity to do that, and you can start to build a relationship that maybe got neglected. And you also get a better idea of how to parent yourself. We talked about this inner critic, and we talked about how the critic responds. Right? We talked about how the critic responds to, to us. So this is where we're going to get a little bit weird here, okay? because the next point here is about parenting the inner child. Parenting the inner child like it needed. So what does this mean? We can say that the critic is, is a voice, right? But who is the critic talking to? The critic is talking to something else. And the critic is, I mean, effectively talking to a child, right? This is, this is what we would call your inner child. So this gets weird because now we start to talk about subpersonalities. And, and you know, when we talk about personality health, really what we're talking about is a healthy relationship between these different subpersonalities that we have. Now, you could get really specific, and you could try to like find a lot of micro ones. And, I, and as far as my experience with this goes, you know, obviously, there are certain mental illnesses, multiple personality disorder, where people actually embody these subpersonalities temporarily, or they create them due to various traumas. But I don't know if you guys have read any of Eckhart Tolle's work. But one of the things he talks about in A New Earth is he talks about how he saw this crazy person talking to himself on the sidewalk. I mean, I live in New York City, so you see that quite a bit. And this is somebody who's, you know, maybe has schizophrenia or something. They're talking to themselves, and he was saying that this, oh, this person's crazy. But then he realized himself that he was doing the same thing. So it's very common for us to have this sort of parent-child dynamic internally. When you reconcile things with the father, the parent actually eases up a bit because you start to think like, because you actually in some sense become the father to your father. And so then you're able to you know, not be so ab abusive, so to speak, to that inner child. But the problem here is that, OK, this is a big, this is a big step forward. And maybe the parent does a bit of a better job. But the child still has a lot of internal pain. And so what a lot of guys do is they reconcile this, and so they, they no longer are beating themselves up. But they're still like, OK, kid, you know, but let's, now we're going to go forward. We don't really need to worry about you anymore. Because I'm not going to attack anymore. We're good. Whereas the kid still feels like crap. And this is something that's really important, because if any of you have ever had a situation where you started to get anxious, you didn't know why. Right? Or, you, or you procrastinated a lot. You didn't know why you were procrastinating. You would self-sabotage. Even if you really were like, this is a really important thing for me to do. I really want this project finished. It's going to be making me really good money. But then you find yourself like, like fucking around on YouTube or something. You're like, why am I doing this? Okay, why am I doing this? Well, what's going on is the inner child's like, hey, what's going on here? Like, you haven't been paying attention to me. Like, you're putting too much pressure on me. Like, I'm scared. I'm, I'm not feeling great. And so the anxiety we feel, because what is procrastination? And this is the whole thing. Like, I think discipline's great. But if you have to be constantly disciplined in everything you do that moves your life forward, like, discipline is a tactical thing. Like, OK, there's a little bit extra pressure. I'm going to push through this. Discipline is not like, i got to be disciplined and get up at you know, the right time in the morning, I got to be disciplined and go to work. I got to be disciplined and go to the gym. 
Like, this is not a discipline issue. This is an issue with internal alignment. And so you have this child gets upset. It has these little tantrums. And a lot of people, what they would do before this step is they usually, that's when they'd attack themselves. And then they redirect energy internally, and they actually can't do stuff. All procrastination is is an anxiety response. That's it. It's distraction. You want to distract yourself from something because you feel anxious. And so the issue isn't like, you know, set a 20-minute timer. I mean, maybe you can do that. But the, the fundamental issue is like, What's going on that you are feeling that anxiety? And so for a lot of people with this inner child, and I'm going to be doing a workshop after lunch today. And if you guys, it's kind of a weird exercise. But if guys have some issues with this, we're going to be going into some like how to get in touch with that inner child. Because there's some interesting sort of, uh, there's an interesting process. But creating this dialogue and checking in, like, what's going on with this kid? How's this kid feeling? Very often what you see happen here is that it's not getting a break. The kid doesn't get a break from you at all. Tons and tons of pressure on this kid. And so when we don't relax, you know, there's this, I was hearing something in a, in a Telegram chat this morning. This guy was talking about his, his friend who works this, like, really, like, you know, it's not a very good, IT job, and he's in front of a screen all day long. And what happens is he comes back from the job, he feels like crap, and then he goes and plays video games on his phone for five hours. And this is a really like common thing that regular people do. And guys in this room would be like, well, I'm not doing that because this is you know, self-improvement, right? We know it's not good to do that. But at the same time, like, what, like that guy is relaxing. He's not relaxing. All this distraction stuff, it, it's, it's him trying to not focus on his need. And the inner child has a lot of needs. Sometimes they're very simple. Sometimes they're like, play with me, right? Let's go do something fun. Like, let's just not feel like we have to do anything. Or maybe it's a boundary issue, right? A lot of the nice guy stuff comes from the inner child's wounds, where the inner child's like, oh, well, I have to, you know, it, it thinks that you have to caretake and you have to be, you have to do whatever like a woman says or whatever if you're going to be able to get your needs met. So it, it decides not to even think about its needs. Let's like tune them out. A lot of guys do that. They tune out their needs entirely and the needs are the inner child's. So some of the things that you can do with that is just really pay attention to it. There's a mentor that I had, Alex Allman. And I started working with him. It's kind of like, he's brilliant. I mean, he's a relationship intimacy coach. And he's been around for like 15 years or something. And I, like, I, I had known about him since I even got started on this journey. I was like 20 years old in college watching his videos in my dorm room. And so it was really cool, like two years back, when I started to work with him in like a mentor capacity. And I was doing it because I wanted to you know, seal up some stuff within my relationship. But it was interesting that the conversation I had with him that was actually the most impactful had to do with this concept of, of laziness and productivity. And I was talking to him, and I said, you know, this was about uh, first two years of my business. You know, I, I, I was just self-sabotaging so much, it was out of control. Because in the past, I would have, you know, I, I would have the fact that, OK, there's a deadline, right? If I didn't finish this paper, I get an F, and then you know, I wouldn't be good enough. And then so I'm going to finish the paper even if I have to stay up all night. And then the same thing repeated itself when I had my corporate job. You know, I had to do some report. Okay, I was put, all, put it off. It's like, all right, I got to pull an all-nighter and stay at the office. But when I started my own business, there's no boss now. It was just me. And so I had all these problems with productivity. I'd try to, I'd try to work. And I would, most days, I wouldn't get anything done at all. I'd just kind of get into a spiral. I'd go distract myself. There was so much like, anxiety within me I didn't realize. So I was talking to him about this. At this point, things had gotten a little bit better, but it was still pretty rough. It was still pretty rough. And I said, you know, how did you really become productive in everything? And he's like, well, what do you mean? It was like, well, what did you do to like, really help to build up your business? And you know, I've been struggling with, with productivity. and. You know, how did you stop being lazy? He said, well, I, I didn't stop being lazy. I said, he said, I'm lazy. 
I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> You're lazy. This is like a guy who's famous, multimillionaire, who has a very similar kind of mindset towards coaching that I do. And so, you know, you have some guy who's like, a pothead who's like chilling on the couch and he says like, yeah, man, it's cool being lazy. It's kind of like, all right, yeah, cool. But when you have a guy like that, who's got a beautiful wife, he's got an incredible life, wealthy, and he tells you, yeah, I'm lazy. It's like, okay, I'm listening here. So he asked me, he said, what is something, what is the time that you felt proud of yourself? And so I was thinking to myself, I was like, must have been the freshman year in college. So Long story short, basically, my whole family was Ivy League, Dartmouth, and I, my freshman, sophomore year in high school, I didn't do too well in a couple of classes, did well in my SATs, pulled, my, pulled it together end of high school, but, you know, my GPA had kind of dropped a bit, and, and I was like, I was going to, I was not going to get into the school. I was worried about that, and I didn't get in, and it was devastating for me. I mean, it seems silly in hindsight to think like, oh, you didn't get into a college, big deal. But emotionally for me, at that time, it was an association with my father. And so for me to not get into the school was for me to not be good enough. And it sort of confirmed, like I had had for like 11 years or so this contract with myself that if you get in, then you're going to be good enough for him. And then I didn't get in. And it was like, nothing matters now. And so I go to a great school freshman year, but I, but I didn't care about the school. I was like, you know, fuck the school. Because I was like, it's, like, I'm not good enough. The school's not good enough. Like, we're all not good enough here, right? It was this sort of thing. And then something happened. So I was, <clears throat> was in a relationship, and my girlfriend was going to be applying to UPenn. And I had not really thought of myself as going to a city school, but I was thinking like, well, you know, my issue was my first two years in high school. So if I do really well my, my freshman year in college, I'll be able to get into that school. Maybe I can get in. And, you know, UPenn's an Ivy League. It's even better than Dartmouth. You know, then I'll really be, I'll be able to fix all this and I'll be able to stay with my high school girlfriend. So I got in. I mean, we broke up <laughs> before the school started, but I got in. And so I told him, I said, you know, this was, this was when I was most proud of myself. I, I worked, I had almost no friends that year. I just worked constantly at school to try to really make sure my grades were incredible. And, you know, I was really, like, I, like probably never been more depressed. Like, I'd have these, I wasn't suicidal, but I'd have these sort of, you know, I'd think to myself, like, I just want to wander off in the woods where nobody can find me. <laughs> it's like kind of like close to that. And he said, you realize that you just said that the time you were most proud of yourself is when you were like borderline suicidal. It's like, man, this is like a kind of weird belief here that I'm only actually good enough if I'm doing things that are, that like don't make my inner child feel good. <laughs> it's like every single thing, that, okay, like inner child shuts up and doesn't get in the way, then things are good. And this is the problem, like, you know, guys who do the self-improvement thing, they think they can kill this part of their personality, and they can't. You can't bully or overpower the inner child. You can, like, stuff him in a closet, and then he'll, like, rattle on the closet door eventually. So all you can do is heal it. So you heal the inner child. You start to pay attention to it. You start to prioritize the inner child over other people. This is boundaries, by the way. Boundaries is basically you're taking consideration of your needs before other people's. And it's important because if the inner child is not getting its needs met, then you're not able to actually perform. The crazy thing is after I took Alex's advice, and I've continued to you know, push that further over time. When I say push that further, I mean take more time off. My productivity has gone up dramatically. I went from struggling to get stuff done like three days a week to being able to easily work six. So it was kind of like funny, this paradox of like, okay, I'm going to be lazy, which actually just made me a more hard worker because I was finally taking into consideration my emotional needs. Which brings us to point number three. I have to use the red marker again because apparently blue doesn't show very well. 
So things are much better now because now you're listening to this child, but there's, a little, there's still one more issue here, right? And this is something that a lot of guys have a hard time with. They're like, well, this child is still, like, how long is this child going to have its needs for? How much am I going to have to, like, constantly stop and check in with this? And this is where a lot of therapy and, like, new age work stops, they just kind of consider this child is always going to be something that you need to just deal with. And, and to an extent, they're right. To an extent, they're right because, you know, it is a part of you. And initially, things are going to be tough resolving. Resolving the issues are going to be tough because you have to think of it like it's a relationship. This is a relationship that you've, like, you've done a very bad job maintaining this relationship for, like, a decade or more. And so you're going to have to take some time in rebuilding the trust. Then you can negotiate a little bit more with this child saying, hey, we're going to go out and play, but today we have to really work. Okay, you just got to, to deal with these, like, all right, I trust you. Whereas initially it's kind of like, screw that, you never do that, you never play, right? But the child doesn't really want to stay a child. Like, this is the whole thing when it comes to personality work. Like, you have these sub-personalities, but ultimately what you want, I mean, if you look, listen to people you know, trying to get quiet minds. I mean, you can meditate, you can meditate, but if you don't do this work, it just pops up again. You have to do the healing. Ultimately, what you want that, when you want that alignment, that alignment is that the inner child is more integrated with the rest of your personality. And so how do you do that so it doesn't just stay a child that constantly is t tugging on your leg? You have to initiate the child. which basically means to turn him into a man. A lot of the, the masculinity work that people, guys do, their issue is that they skip these early steps. And so they're like, well, it's got, got to be tough. We've got to do these things. And so the child is, is doing some of this stuff, acting like a man, but doesn't really feel like it belongs in a certain sense. It doesn't have a, you don't have a good relationship with it. Whereas contrast with more like new age healing stuff, they stop here. They really don't understand this part because this is a really important thing for men in particular. Men have lost their initiation. We talked about how men, when they were in their early teens, used to be taken and educated, so to speak. They would go on a process from the older men in the community where they would basically turn into a, to a man and they'd test themselves. Today, we don't really have that. We don't really have that anymore. A lot of those rituals disappeared in the Middle Ages. And then since the Industrial Revolution, fathers have been completely taken away from their sons more and more as less, less and less people farmed. In America, up until 1910, you still had 90% of people worked on farms. Contrast that by the 1950s. Is it any wonder that there is a revolution that got tired of all the, you know, people romanticized the 1950s, but there was a lot of stuff going on beneath the surface that led to it, in addition to all the PSYOP stuff that we've talked about, which I 100% agree with. So what do we do with this child? Now, part of it is finding other mentors and coaches, people who can act as, you know, as Robert Bly, Iron John would talk about, as a sacred king, someone who could do the work that the father couldn't do to help to move them in that direction. And that's 100% helpful. And usually they play certain roles in that journey and speed up the process dramatically. But I think that you also need to go to the place where all initiations happened. All initiations throughout history always happen in the same environment, the wilderness. Nature teaches a man how to be a man. You're not distracted by other things out there. You may have to fend for yourself. You have to deal with the elements. You have to deal with potential dangers, some animals, bears, whatever, especially when you go out to real serious wildernesses. And what happens in this journey is you and the child are together. And you can take that child and you start to pull it through the process. You're working together to accomplish a goal. Now, I'm going to be fully honest here. I'm still experimenting a lot with this area because there's not a, there's not a lot of 
benchmarks or guides to show us how to do it. But last week, I tried something different. So I went on an 80 mile trek in the Appalachians for a week and I didn't eat. It was about 152 hour fast by the end of it. And the purpose of this was to put me through mental and physical and spiritual conditions that maybe there'd be some sort of initiation that would come out of it. I'll be writing about that in more depth, but you know, I don't know how many of you guys have fasted. Fasting's very, I mean, I lost 10 pounds. I guess great, but it's, it's, uh, it's a very like, powerful experience from a spiritual perspective. You lose a lot of energy, especially going uphill. The second day of that trip was very, very rough because your body has to transition. But after that, you get this an incredible clear-headedness. I mean, physically, it's still, you're going about half as fast as you would go normally. But you start to get really clear-headed, and the rest of the world starts to fade away. And one of the things that, that I notice in here was that I started to lean heavily, more, more and more heavily on the highest father, I suppose you could say. And I started to feel a sense of initiation that was coming from above, that I was getting guidance. I was getting support. I don't know if this is going to be everybody's path, but going out in the wilderness and testing yourself I mean, it was cold all the time. You know, you're, you're hungry, you're tired. But you feel, start to feel unified. And since I've come back, I'm still in this processing. Because a lot of the, the, the child part doesn't feel so much like a child anymore. It feels more like a teenager. Like it's gone through something. And it doesn't want to act like a child. Now, this is not a single process. This is not like a single event. You have to continue to reiterate this. But I think for a lot of you guys that are struggling to fully get past all of this sort of you know, internal dynamics, I really recommend you go out in nature and test yourself. So putting this all together, what is, what is like real self-improvement? Self-improvement that's like healthy and you know, wholesome, good for guys. Because we can say that, remember, self-improvement in the context of being a victim is a step in the right direction. But at a certain point, you realize that, you know, me watching these other accounts and they're talking about this, you know, they're talking about the like Playboy lifestyle or they're talking about, you know, making, you know, seven figures on some e com thing. Eventually, like a lot of guys, if they don't have their direction, they can get pulled in all these different, they can get pulled in all, all these different directions and they feel like they can lose themselves. What you start to realize as you get down this process more and more is it's not about addition, it's about subtraction. That you guys have, each of you, have your own incredible journey ahead of you. And you really lose out in the end when you focus on somebody else's journey. When you see that somebody's doing this and that maybe I could do that. This is part of the busy mind. There's real serious clarity underneath it all. And the more stuff you begin to remove, the more the path becomes clear. And it's, and it's an incredible adventure. So if there's anything I can leave you guys with today, it's this idea of taking what resonates and leaving the rest. Right now, you're at a conference. You're being exposed to ideas. This is a period of openness. And you guys are receiving. Once this is done, let it marinate and see what resonates, keep that, and discard the rest of it. That's how you become a true man. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to take some questions if anybody has questions. Thank you, Pat. That was a great talk. I think uh, the necessity of inner transformation for men and initiation isn't talked about enough. Um, and just to speak to that point, I do have a question, but just to speak to that point, 
there's an organization called the Mankind Project that mm. runs a weekend called the New Warrior Training Adventure. They run, it's a men's initiation, 48 hours. I attended that in 2013, and that was the beginning of my journey through masculinity. It's an incredibly powerful experience, mm. and I highly recommend it to every man in this room, and I think they'll begin running. It's, they've initiated 70,000 men around the world mm. um, in all, all different countries, in Europe and Australia and Mexico and all these different places. So I highly recommend every man in the room check it out. It's, it's a great experience for men. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I have great respect for your own initiation, an 80 mile hike while fasting. You know, I fasted for, for 10 days before and I wasn't hiking. I wasn't doing anything, but I couldn't imagine like doing an 80 mile hike. So major respect for that. Um, speak. I, w I was wondering if you could speak more. You said um, procrastination is an anxiety response. Mm -hmm. And you said that your mentor said that he was also lazy. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on how laziness showed up for him. Um, was he actually being lazy or was he just reframing the idea in a way for you? That's a really good question. I don't know what he was doing, but over time I've sort of reframed it myself because really what laziness means to me in this context, we, we live in like a workaholic culture. I mean, it's kind of like, I, I get really tired of seeing it online or it's like hustle 16 hours. It's like, all right, you know, there's periods where you can do that stuff, but it takes a toll. I mean, I've never met a guy who does that continually that there's very few exceptions. Maybe, maybe Donald Trump, right? But pretty much like every guy who's, who has to work like that over a period of time, they get a burnout, right? It doesn't, does, not, does not end well for them. So in the context of what my, my mentor was saying, I think he was really talking about like, knowing when to take breaks and not feeling like you have to work. There's really something to be said for the power of boredom. So kind of like a little hack when it comes to dealing with procrastination. Um, and I think this is tactical. I would try to expand it to a, a broader part of life. It was one of the benefits of this sort of initiation process because there's no dopamine, right? You're not getting any dopamine out there. Is allowing yourself to be bored like, what happens is that we start to feel this tension inside of us, like, and it's usually anxiety about something we have to do, and then our mind will flip, like, oh, I, I meant to check out this video. Oh, I wonder what's, you know, going on over here. And, and our mind just flies over there immediately. So part of it has to do with us not being able to d deal with tension in our body, but then there's also this point, like, well, we don't rest. We don't rest. Just sitting there and doing nothing. Like before this speech, I sat down and I did nothing for an hour. Just like sat on my bed, like quasi meditating. Just let the mind chill out. I do that more and more. And, and since the trip, I'm really like doing it more regularly because I can see how I get pulled in to, okay, social media or this thing. So, when you, re when you relax more, your nervous system starts to, I mean, just even talking physiologically, not having to go into the depth stuff, your nervous system starts to, to relax, and, and then you're able to actually produce more. People talk about this like you can get more done in four to five hours in a day if you're really focused than you can like just fucking around for 12. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you, guys.